Uh, today, Peter. Today, Peter Ashpin uh, will present his paper, uh, Quest Potential for Couples K Problems and Gate Height Bifurcation. So, uh, whenever you're ready, you can start. Okay, I, I hope you can hear me. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. And yes, you can, can see the, um, uh, the screen, right? Yes, good, good. Okay, um, well, this is something that um, was recently um, published in his Rev E, um, and um, I guess I did credit Pippis a little bit for um, for supporting it. But uh, I have to apologise right at the beginning that there's not really much in the way of Earth systems, um, but still, it's um, a sort of a mechanism, a mechanism that I've been looking at with. Um, a couple of collaborators on a couple of escape problems, and we do think that maybe there will be some uh, applicability in, in some cases. So let's just launch into it. Um, I'll talk a little bit about cascades of tipping and what they might be, um, and focus really on noise induced tipping cascades. Um, a little bit on two node and three nodes, very simple models where we can actually do quite a lot in terms of understanding um, sequences and uh, I would say qualitative changes in behavior of um, a coupled system uh, as you change a parameter in the weak noise limit. Um, maybe I'll talk a bit about three no uh, nodes as well, but um, I, I guess this is meant to be 40 minutes so um, or 45 minutes, so I'll, I'll try and keep the time. Uh, and then I'll talk about um, Quasi potential methods to try and find escape rates in such systems. Um, well, probably in this audience, I don't need to say too much about uh, the importance of um, how one tipping point may affect another, or more specifically, how one subsystem tipping may affect tipping of other subsystems that are coupled to it. And um, of for this community, I guess the uh, coupled climate tipping elements is um, something that has been increasingly uh, looked at as something of interest. Uh, put a few names down there, uh, but there are, are many more that are, I think are starting to look at this. Um, but also in things like uh, coupled um, financial systems, if you have bankruptcy of one financial institution, how does it affect others? Um, the idea of contagion in financial elements um, in financial system, or how does uh, epilepsy spread uh, in the brain during seizures? There's evidence that it, it will tend to start at one focus and then spread um, if the conditions are, are right. Um, and uh, there's a, a, a nice little advert that maybe I will indulge you with that appeared on um, television a, a few years ago. It was for Honda, um, and I think it nicely illustrates the sort of effect that you can get if you have a number of um, systems that are, in particular, if they are on the point of instability themselves, if they're close to a tipping point, um, then one of them tipping can affect uh, the other. Um, and it, it potentially, you can get Cascades. Now, of course, um, with this particular advert, apparently they took ages um, to set it up. It was all done in one one take. Um, so maybe such really long tipping cascades are are not a generic uh, of system, but at least one or two connections may be. Um, uh, I think we're back. Halfway through now, um, and the common thing is that all of these systems are um, on point. They have more than one stable state, um, and the stable state that they are in is sort of marginally stable. Um, let's get rid of that. Um, but what are 
tipping cascade. Um, that's one sort of question that I think uh, we probably haven't fully answered, at least to, to my satisfaction. Um, I think Julian Newman has a nice idea, which is uh, uh, if you have a, um, a multi-element tipping cascade, um, the, the issue is that if you have, if you think of tipping as uh, a small influence creating a large um, output, a small in, change in the input creating a large change in the output, then um, if you have a, a, a sort of a string of systems that are coupled to each other, um, and as soon as the first one tips, you actually have a large input going to the second system. So is that really a tipping? Um, I guess there's a sort of philosophical question there. So the sort of um, system that, that we've considered in, in a, we have a few papers here and I'll talk about the sort of the sequence in them um, leading up to quasar potentials, uh, is if you have um, a number of systems that are each um, close to instability, but there's some noise, and then the coupling changes the nature of that system, but doesn't immediately tip it, um, then we call that a new noise-induced tipping cascade. Okay, so let's start with a particular model we were looking at, which is sometimes called a, a Schlegel model. Um, but it's a polynomial one-dimensional system, um, and you can see there are roots at one and a plus or minus root mu. Um, and what, what you have is you have a, a stable, what we call a quiescent attractor at xq minus root mu. We have an active attractor at x is one. And then between the two of them, um, there is an unstable equilibrium at plus root mu, uh, plus, plus root nu. Um, so if I take nu very small, those two get closer and closer and there's like a saddle node bifurcation when nu is zero. But if you look at the, the case where nu is small, we've got a definite quiescent attractor, uh, but its basin of attraction is quite small uh, and it's much more easy to escape from there to the active state than back. And we'll be using that in, in the analysis. So now suppose you have a number of such simple, very simple tipping systems uh, with a quiescent and an active node, and you couple them together in the simplest way possible um, just by linear coupling. So we've got beta um, is uh, some coupling strength. For the ith node, we've got a number of neighbors. We'll that list those as n subscript i. Um, and then we are particularly interested in the case where you have um, iid um, Wiener noise on each of the systems. So there's a number of parameters here. There's a parameter in the uh, how close you are to marginal stability. There's a parameter in what the coupling strength is. Um, and then there's a parameter in terms of the noise we're going to add to it. Um, and such systems have been looked at before in the literature. Um, here's uh, a few names from especially the 1980s, um, but not in the specific question I, that we're going to look at, which is really sort of almost irreversible, uh, looking at a timescale of irreversibility where you can escape from the quiescent to the active state, but um, the probability of an escape back is uh, astronomically small. So for beta is zero, um, the escapes are independent of which of the uh, elements escapes. Um, and how do the, the statistics of the escape change as the coupling strength beta and the network structure and maybe the parameters in the um, in the uh, the new in the individual uh, cells that sort of change, modulate the excitability of each of these cells. Um, so if you like, it's a question of how does dependence in these escape probabilities start to appear. So um, I'll spend a little bit of time on two node bidirectional case, which is simplest you can imagine really. 
um, with non-trivial coupling. So we've got X1 and X2 are two such systems. Um, so we've clearly got uh, a range of equilibria. Um, if we take alpha is zero, so the noise-free case, we've got uh, both quiescent, both active, or both at the saddle. So those are equilibria. Um, and then uh, in the case where beta is small, in particular, if beta is zero, you're going to get also cases where one has escaped and the other has not, and one is on a saddle and the other is not. So for example, uh, XAQ, where the first one is has escaped, it's active, and the second one is still quiescent. Um, and you can do a little bit of algebra and see that um, actually that these solutions here will appear in a range of bifurcations as you change beta or nu. Um, so if I, if I restrict to the case of nu small, um, so we're close to excitable in the uh, in the quiescent state, um, there'll be a saddle node bifurcation as you increase beta, and then after that, a pitchfork bifurcation, um, where, where these things all disappear. So if a large enough beta, all you're left with are the, the fully coupled, if you like, um, the fully symmetric equilibria. So if we're interested to quantify the, um, uh, the actual transition rate and um, what are we going to be measuring? Well, let's assume that all of them start at the, the quiescent state and we'll pick some threshold for the ice node, say, when we've got beyond that. So we'll pick it outside the, um, uh, the saddle, between the saddle and the, and the active state. Um, and then the first escape time of the ith node will be defined to be the random variable where that ith node exceeds the threshold. Um, and well, let's first think about the escape sequence. Uh, what uh, if we if it's uncoupled, then either the first one or the second one will escape uh, first, and then the other one will escape afterwards. But if you have a number of them, there'll be some permutation of one to n, or s of i. Um, we can choose this with probability one in the realization such that we get one escape happening after the other. Um, and uh, presumably there is some probability that you can assign to each sequence, which is something that we can measure. In the case where they're uncoupled, uh, beta is zero, and also for the case of globally coupling, um, all sequences will be equally likely. And that means that the probability of seeing a particular sequence is just uh, one over the number of possible permutations. Um, if anyone wants to interrupt or ask questions, uh, feel free. Let's uh, define a, a few sort of useful uh, random variables. So the time of the escape, um, the time of the ith escape, this is um, the, uh, if we know the permutation, the particular permutation is such that we get um, this, uh, this ordering, we can call that tau i. The time between escapes, um, j and k, if k is bigger than j, uh, that's just the, um, for that particular realization, how much time occurred between the j's and the k's escapes. So these are random variables, but we can look at their means. Uh, so the mean of the ith escape, oh, sorry, there's, there should be a bracket around this one, the time of the ith escape to distinguish it from when the ith node escapes. And then the mean time between these escapes, uh, k and k, we can look at the expectation of that over all realizations of the noise. Um, and one can use the traditional framers a ring formula um, in the case where we have um, potentials, uh, potentials for the couple system, and we'll get uh, expressions such as this, that the um, probability at uh, the mean um, rate of the ith, sorry, this is the case beta equals zero for so the uncoupled case, then the uh, 
the mean time of escape for the ith node that will be independent of everything else and it's just given by what is the potential barrier that you need to overcome uh, in the case where alpha goes to zero and then there's this sort of um, three-factor terms that aren't really very important. Um, okay, so the, how uh, the ti are identically distributed and all sequences are, are equally probable for beta equals zero. And the things which we've been looking at is how are the distributions of uh, how and p of s change as you increase beta. And in particular, uh, a few years ago, we did a paper where we uh, identified there are sort of three identifiable regimes on varying beta uh, in the weak noise limit. So this is like a distinguished parameter limit where you consider varying a beta and then you take uh, noise goes to zero. In the weak coupling regime, we have that quiescent states are perturbed by one escape but they're not destroyed. Uh, and so the escape of one node will modify the rate of escape of another node, but it remains a, um, uh, a stochastic process with a sort of exponential tail. If we go to um, strong coupling, um, the nodes are synchronized and they either escape or they do not escape en masse. Um, we call this a fast domino effect, that basically one, uh, one of the nodes um, performing an escape during a transition causes all of the others to escape at uh, the same time with small sort of variability around that escape time. Uh, the most interesting case actually is the intermediate coupling regime where escape of one node gives a a delayed response from the other units, but it's determined essentially deterministic that noise is it is committed to escape as first the, as soon as the first one is escaped, but it may take a long time. Uh, and this is how the we would say the um uh, the video that I showed has been set up so that you have a sequence of slow domino effect um, where you only need uh, a small perturbation in the first unit for them all to escape. Now here's a bifurcation diagram for the two coupled here you've got. Um, this shows one of the coordinates against the coupling strength beta. Uh, you can see both of them quiescent, XQQ, both of them active, XAA, XSS. The, um, there's a, uh, uh, an unstable state here. And for small enough beta, um, you have an extra branch here, which is X. QA state. Um, so this is one which is um, perturbed and exists for small enough beta one. So this is like the, um, the weak coupling limit. This is the strong coupling, the fast domino, and then uh, the slow dominoes can appear in this region. So you don't have another um, stable state, but you can get um, slow passage in particularly here. Uh, just after the bifurcation, the subtle node bifurcation has happened that destroys XQA. Um, you can uh, uh, see um, a very long period of time where you seem to be close to um, escape. Um, so we, in the case for two um, couple systems with symmetric coupling, that still has a potential. So we can use a multi-dimensional version of Kramer's formula, uh, and it's, it's the same as before. It's um, the, uh, there's a minimum height pass saddle or a gate, which you need to get over. So in order, so the mean time to get from uh, X to, well, basically Y is going to be assumed to be a, a, an attractor and we're going to a neighborhood of Y, uh, that passes over a minimum height saddle um, will be given by a formula like this. So this is the exponential term, this is the, the leading term, and then you have this pre-factor that depends on the Hessian, I guess, um, the curvature of the potential at Z star, and I think also at, at X 
star as well. Um, so here's a here's a few uh, simulations. So this is small beta. So no, this is zero beta, and you can see um, the the potential. This is a particular realization. Um, you hop into the, the stable state here, and then you um, transition from that. And so in this case, there are two gates. You can either exit through one or the other of these because of symmetry, they're equal height. Um, small enough beta, the picture is the same, but for larger beta, um, you actually, uh, you escape through one of these two saddles. Um, and depending on which saddle you escape, you, you end up lingering for quite a long time during um, where the saddle node has sort of just happened. For larger beta, actually this equilibrium here becomes a saddle. In this case, it's actually a source. Um, and then you'll escape over the XSS. Okay, I'm going to, we, we can get formulae basically for the, um, uh, the mean escapes and okay, can I ask a question? Yes, hello, uh, yes. you, you go go back one. So is she uh, yeah. So it seems that so so you, you have these control lines for you, for your potential, right? And it seems yes. like it's uh, the, um, the 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 path you take is along the least uh, graded because you're going upgraded. Is that can, can uh, you understand no, no, that maybe, easily? So okay, maybe it's not quite so clear. This the one in the bottom left is also in a uh, potential well, mm -hmm. uh, but it's quite a shallow potential well, and there are no contours left in it. So actually, this is a well here. These uh, two are passes, and then you're going downhill to here, and then you're on a sort of um, chair uh, like thing, and then you go downhill to here, and then this is another. Uh, so, so, so where, where where's the barrier? Is there's no barrier? You're you're simply tipping it. Here there's a barrier. Here there is no barrier. Yeah. It's just this is like a, a metastable state. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Um, yes. Yeah, so we've got various formulae for how you can evaluate this in terms of the um, the Kramer's potentials. And then we do this for three, but I'm just going to go straight over this into the quasi-potential uh, message to find escape rates in the more general case where we don't have a potential. Um, and if you've not seen this before, um, it'll take, uh, I probably won't make much sense here, but the idea is we get a stochastic differential equation, which has some, uh, this is NITO, SDE, where you have uh, a deterministic part, and let's just consider additive noise, um, multi-dimensional Brownian motion, IID on each component. Um, and we can relate this to uh, the dynamics of the ordinary differential equation and sort of, if you like, um, large deviations of solutions of a stochastic differential equation can be understood in terms of um, properties of the ordinary differential equation. If F was the gradient of some smooth potential, then we're back into airing and famous. When we're not, um, in fact, typically no such potential exists, and we say the system is non-gradient. Uh, and in that case, what we can do is still define a quasi-potential by um, the method of this is Friedlin and Benzel. Um, we define an action, which is a functional that depends on pass. So if we start at some point, let's say X, uh, sorry, we start at some set A, and then the uh, quasar potential relative to set A at the point X is going to be the, in, be the infimum of some um, action uh, values over paths that start in A and end at x. Um, so in particular, if a is invariant and asymptotically stable, then u of a will have a minimum at a um, in the neighborhood of the uh, uh, basin of 
sorry, well, I guess it's a minimum at A um, within the basin of A. For, I think this has been around for quite a few years, the, um, the quasar potential and the idea of um, an action. So we'll just talk about the action for a moment. So this is for every possible trajectory, you penalize how far the derivative is from what it would be um, if it was a deterministic path. So note the square means that this is always positive. Uh, and so if you, if you have a trajectory that goes from A and runs to X, then necessarily the closer potential will be zero at that point. So it's, it's, it becomes interesting when you have, when you, when you, um, relative to some attracting set A, and you're looking at points that are outside of A. If you want to compute this, um, it's useful to uh, consider an equivalent action that doesn't actually worry about time um, parameterization of the paths, but rather parameterize them in, in any old way, for example, by arc length. And uh, if we consider this, so Cameron uh, 2012 shows that um, this is a uh, this is equivalent to um, the uh, Franklin Ventil um, action, and that similarly the quasar potential can be um, uh, computed in terms of um, the minimum action uh, for all possible paths that start in A and X. But now I'm not parameterizing by time. And parameterizing by anything. One can transform this problem, which of course is a uh, sort of rather tricky um, uh, variational problem, um, calculus of variations into a, a differential equation problem um, by looking at uh, a related Hamilton Jacobi equation. Um, so this is. Uh, Unfortunately, the, it's quite a badly behaved um, differential equation. If you look at this, actually, you see what u squared. So what is known is f, f of x. Uh, a is known, and your problem is to solve for u of x. But if you can see this immediately, that um, if I can take u of x is equal to zero, uh, that is a solution. Um, and so we're interested in um, uh, continuous but not necessarily differentiable or property solutions of this problem, um, this ill-posed problem. It's like a sort of a free boundary problem. Um, hamilton jacobi equations, uh, as far as I know, are used, um, for example, for um, wave propagation in media. Uh, so it's a bit like that, um, but uh, a bit more horrible. Uh, there are numerical methods, however, that have been developed for such things as an ordered upwind method. Um, and Cameron, and in particular, uh, Dahia and Cameron have developed numerical code to compute um, the quasar potential from uh, such um, no, basically knowledge of F. Uh, even for, for the case where you go, a more general case, I've looked at um, uh, additive noise, um, which is isotropic. Um, you can even do it for anisotropic noise or state dependent noise. So why do we compute this? Well, it's because we can get formulae for the expectation of escape times in terms of the, um, uh, the quasi potential. So very similar to um, the freedom pencil, although uh, we don't have sort of control over the prefactor. So this is like a uh, a scaling of the logarithm of the expected escape time. Um, so what is a gate? So you can have a you can have a gate. This is a um, for a potential. You can have a gate for a quasar potential, which is the um, a the lowest um, is a point on the basin boundary um, such that uh, you are lower. You have a lower quasar potential than other all other points on uh, the basin boundary. Um, there may be multiple gates if they're symmetries of the system, but nonetheless, um, if you have an escape 
then typically this will be through a um, through one of these gates. So let's go back to coupled uh, by stable systems. Um, but now we can start to deal with the case where um, it's not just symmetrically coupled. So this is sort um, of as before. Uh, if we have unidirectional coupling, it no longer has, um, this is no longer a, a variational problem in terms of this, it's not a potential problem anymore. Um, similarly for a chain of three nodes, there's no three dimensional potential that defines that. Um, so we can look at the escape time from the ice node um, as before, this is the, um, well, I've got the brackets in the right place now. Uh, this is a random variable and the first return to um, XQ for some node I is the first time uh, such that um, you, the, okay, we've got to have, we've got to have two thresholds here now. You can look at first returns of what happens if actually you escape and then you come back before the other one has escaped. Then we start to get different statistics. So this is just comparing uh, in the symmetrically coupled case, uh, the quasar potential and the potential. And you can see they're basically the same thing up to the point of where you hit the gate. After that, um, you'll have a flat quasar potential because you can actually go sort of downhill to escape along that, the line of the um, unstable manifold. Uh, so that's the potential. So here's some contour lines showing quasar potentials computed for uh, the system. This is in the uh, sort of for reference. This is for the um, symmetric case, um, uncoupled, and uh, the difference between quasar potential and potential is that the potential is a, a, a global property. Quasar potential is only ever going to be local and it depends on where you compute it from. So this is the, the top left is um, computed from uh, XQQ. The one on the right is computed from XAA. The one in the middle is computed from the sort of the partially escaped XAQ state. Uh, we can take sections through this to see how this varies and compare with the, um, the potential in those cases. Um, so the quasar potential agrees with the potential up to the gate if it does have a potential, um, and then it escapes. Yes, I think I said that already. But for beta greater than zero, the asymmetrically coupled is non gradient, and we compute the quasar potential in this case. So this is for increasing beta. Um, so this is computed from the XQQ state, um, and you can see there's a, there's some something asymmetric happening here as beta increases. Um, Apple node up here happens quite a long time before the uh, the saddle node down here happens, and in fact the saddle node down here happens not with the between these two, but rather it occurs between these two between this um, saddle and this node. So the bottom line that's showing the quasar potentials computed from XAA. And so between the two of them, you get a pretty good picture of what the statistics of um, escapes uh, of this system will look like, other than when you end up actually at this sort of partly escaped state. Why on the time? Okay. Um, so uh, yes, as it increases, that's what's shown in the previous one, um, the partially escaped state undergoes a saddle node bifurcation at some value of beta, and that's the end of the weak coupling regime. So we've still got a weak coupling regime, just as in the uh, symmetrically coupled case, um, but uh, even though this one has now disappeared, it um, disappears, sorry, this, this stable equilibrium disappears at a later date. Um, and uh, you get a, other, a few other bifurcations. You've got unstable states, X squared and XSS. They'll meet at a transcritical bifurcation. 
at a larger value of beta. Uh, and then S, Q and A, Q undergo a saddle node bifurcation at SN2. And then there's a final saddle node bifurcation at SN3. So this is sort of showing the bifurcation diagram. You've got uh, three saddle nodes and one transcritical. Um, so for now adding in small amplitude noise, you can ask the question of what is the, what are the statistics of the transitions here? We can uh, estimate them. These are actually from uh, Monte Carlo simulations and match them to um, the rates that you'd expect from uh, looking at the quasar potentials. Um, and one particular thing that we noticed here is um, that there is a sort of a, a qualitative change that occurs as you pass through this third saddle node. Um, even though there are no um, stable equilibria left, so the, the only stable equilibria that are left are the Q and the AA. They're both either not escaped or they're both escaped. Um, and that is uh, the date from which you escape from the partially escaped state actually changes um, as you uh, uh, as you get close to this. So for certain values of beta, um, when you escape in the direction of x1, instead of going back to the more probable x2, there is a chance it will return to xqq. Um, so we can see this now. This is computing the quasar potential starting at the partly, the partially escaped state, um, and you can see you've got uh, two gates nearby, or you've got two saddles nearby, and you go from this being the gate uh, to this one being the gate. And actually, it becomes more probable to skip back to the the uh, QQ state. So we can. Um, Evaluate this by looking at the quasi potential height starting at the partly escaped attractor. And you can see for the two of these, they, um, they stay uh, in, in one order up to some point where until you hit beta G, and this is the gate height bifurcation. Um, and as you get to the gate height bifurcation, um, that gives you some consequences. So I'm going to wrap up here maybe with this this diagram um, so this is a large number of simulations shown for um, some values of beta increasing values of beta and note this is a, a probability so that a very large number of simulations have been done here um, in order to get sort of reasonable statistics and what we're doing is each of these is the um, the probability that we start in, um, and this is the three node system, I've actually jumped up a, a, a step. We start with them all in the Q state and we end up with them all in the A state and then we stop. The first time we, they end up in the A state, we stop. And depending on um, the sequence, in this case, we get three, two, one, uh, that's the most likely sequence. Um, but there are a whole variety of other sequences that can appear um, with less probability. Uh, after the gate height bifurcation, we find much more complicated sequences start to appear where you basically flip between the twos and then one and then two transitions back, then one transitions back and so on until they're all escaped. Um, so that's the sort of the message that we've got a, a mechanism that in the weak noise limit really can be seen as a, um, a qualitative bifurcation in this set of stochastic systems. Um, and that's associated with the gate height bifurcation. Uh, there's a potential. I know several people on this call are very interested in this at the moment. Uh, this was the work, I guess, that got me interested in it. Um, it's a useful tool um, to understand noise-driven escapes. Um, I hope it finds some interesting applications in, in uh, uh, Earth system problems. Um, and it allows you to step beyond your usual um, Kramer's uh, escape rates to, to generalize them. 
another message is that I guess in general, heterogeneous networks uh, can have different coupling regimes depending on um, in the weak noise limit, depending on other parameters. And one particular transition is the gate height bifurcation, uh, where as a result of changing a parameter, you have your most likely direction of escape changes. Okay, that's 45 minutes about. So um, thank you very much. Um, and uh, just sort of put up the, the, the references. So this is work with Ken Creaser and Razi Taneva, um, really inspired by um, work on models in epilepsy. Um, but I'd say it, it's really been a, um, a sort of a qualitative uh, an attempt to un understand coupled noisy escapes in in um in systems coupled dynamical systems okay